I, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Wayne Simpson, who is a professor in the Department of, uh, of Economics here at the University of Manitoba. Uh, the Wayne's expertise spans a number of fields, including labor economics, applied econometrics, social policy, and applied microeconomics. Uh, he's published in a variety of fields, including basic income, but also in articles like Canadian Economics in Decline, Implications for Canada's Economics Journals, um, Balanced Budget Legislation in Western Canada, uh, Information Technology and in the Changing Workplace in Canada, and Explaining Declining Social Assistance Participation Rates. Um, of course, uh, I guess uh, one very important, one, one vital contribution that Wayne's made along with uh, a collaborator, uh, Dr. Derek Hum, who is a professor emeritus, now retired from the University of Manitoba, a very careful empirical analysis of the, the, min, the MinCom experiment in Dauphin. Uh, I, I've certainly relied my, my, to myself very heavily on a work they brought out in 1991 on uh, examining labor market effect of the, the Dauphin experiment, but uh, uh, Wayne and Derek have, have done other articles and published other pieces on the, the Dauphin experiment as well. So I, I, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Wayne Simpson. Uh, thank you. Is, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so um, I was asked to talk about the labor supply question and uh, it would have been better had I been able to do it when uh, Evelyn Forge presented her work on, uh, on Dauphin, which was part of the uh, MinCom experiment as well, uh, but I was teaching, so I have a ex good excuse. Uh, the other thing I should say is that I'm going to talk about a little more than just the labor supply question, but I think there are things that, that bear on the question of... Uh, uh, the economic feasibility of a basic income or a guaranteed annual income and relate the two. And uh, I should also say that uh, since uh, this is all things that uh, I did in collaboration with Derek Hum, he is uh, to receive half the blame and, and half the credit, I suppose, too. <coughs> so the key points I want to make, uh, first of all, the middle point is the one about the uh, uh, guaranteed annual income experiment, the so-called Manitoba basic annual income experiment, which in a sense already combines the idea of basic income with uh, guaranteed annual income because uh, it was a guaranteed annual income experiment as I'll explain, but it talks about it as a basic annual income. Um, it was much more than Dauphin. Dauphin was a portion of that experiment which was not analyzed for the purposes of the labor supply questions. That was the Winnipeg portion, the so-called dispersed sample, and I'll talk about what that was as a classic uh, uh, guaranteed annual income or negative income tax experiment. Um, and. Uh, <coughs> Then there's two other points. The one before that I want to talk about is um, this question of what we mean by a basic income and a guaranteed annual income and how the two ideas get conflated, uh, depending on your perspective, or confused or integrated. And I'll try to show how they, uh, how they directly relate. And I'll try to relate that to the labor supply question and how economists think about it, because I think there's some important ways in the way economists think about it that are uh, relevant to that question. Uh, and then talk a little bit about how uh, there have been some advances uh, in terms of uh, provincial programs and federal programs, uh, refundable tax credits and so on, that reflect the advances of what I would call a guaranteed annual income in Canada. So what is a guaranteed annual income? Guaranteed annual income has these two components. Um, one is the, uh, the guarantee, and this is common to the basic income. And uh, the typical idea is to base it on some sort of uh, measure of low income uh, cutoff or poverty, um, which is related to family size, regional differences in cost of living, and so on and so forth. And I've given an example here of the uh, Statistics Canada LICO that I borrowed from another uh, talk I gave, um, which is about 22,000 for a family of two in 2008. And uh, there's also other ways of measuring it. The provinces go about uh, measuring uh, market baskets, and the federal government also has a market basket measure. Um, and these more better reflect the regional differences in cost of living so that we don't, don't get dumped in with uh, Vancouver as if uh, it costs the same to live in both cities. The other side of this, though, that's important is that uh, guaranteed annual income also involves this negative income tax or benefit reduction rate. And this is what reduces the benefit as income is earned. So if, for example, you talk about a benefit reduction rate of 50% and you talk about a guarantee of 22000 and then someone starts earning income and they earn $10,000, what happens 
is that the benefit is reduced by 50% of what they earn, which is $5,000. So that comes off the benefit, really. The, the benefit paid out by government becomes 17000 and they keep their 10000 So that is the, the tax rate, if you will. But the tax rate really is, goes on, on the earnings in the sense that they're only keeping 5000 of the additional income that they're earning. So that we would say that their after-tax income is 50% less than their before-tax or gross income. So then what is a basic income? Well, a basic income is, uh, again, a guarantee of some sort. And I think it's probably in the discussions based on the same sort of principles related to low-income cutoffs, poverty lines, adjusted for family size, adjusted for regional differences. Doesn't have to be. Um, sometimes, uh, although there are no clear examples where there are tremendous regional variations, it, uh, it might uh, not vary by region, but for example, Alaska, where there wouldn't be much regional variation, simply said, we've got all these royalties we're generating, we're going to pay so much per person uh, based on these royalties. Western Australia has considered something similar. Um, Canada has the old age security which originally was designed as what we would call a demigrant or a basic income keyed to a particular part of the population, seniors, um, but now is more like a guaranteed annual income. Why? Because a portion of it is clawed back. And this is a distinctive difference between at least my conception of the basic income as it's usually discussed and the basic idea of a guaranteed annual income, which is essentially what the Americans call a negative income tax. Uh, and that is this benefit reduction rate, which is explicitly introduced on the first dollar of earnings to claw back, uh, claw back the benefit. And that'll be familiar to provincial social assistance programs and so on as well. Another example was the family allowance. Again, when it was, my mother called it the baby bonus. I don't know if that was ever its official name, but the family allowance was uh, a, a, a payment to families uh, for children up to a certain age. And it was unconditional. It was paid to every family regardless of income. Again, it's now clawed back. Uh, and the, the current system is even more clawed back if you include the National Child Benefit Supplement to the child tax credit, which is more income conditioned than the child tax credit itself. And then, uh, just to point out how these things get conflated, uh, here's the uh, relatively now well-known Yukon House motion in 2007. It says, this House encourages the Yukon government to research and develop a policy on a guaranteed annual income uses that term, as recommended by the Royal Commission on Status Women, which was the McDonald Commission, etc. All the way going back to the Special Senate Committee on Poverty, where this, this idea all began in Canada, brought up from uh, discussions that are already ongoing in the U.S. Um, they say it'll be a simple, non-taxable basic income available to all adults. Well, that is a basic income, right? As I understand it, that is the idea. It, recoverable through the income tax system for those earning over a certain amount, well, over basic personal amount in the tax system, um, that would eliminate or significantly reduce social the social assistance system and simplify administration and reduce administrative costs. The one thing that doesn't jibe in here is that while this describes a basic income, the McDonald Commission uh, the, and certainly the Senate Commission on Poverty did propose a guaranteed annual income. And that would have had a benefit reduction rate attached to it. And in fact, in the McDonald Commission, the Universal Income Security Program, the UISP or WISP, it said the tax uh, rate, the benefit reduction rate on earnings starting from dollar one should be 20%. So there, the two ideas are, are brought together, but it's not clear whether they're really talking about the guaranteed annual income, which has a benefit reduction, or whether they're talking about the, uh, the basic annual income, which doesn't have a benefit reduction, other than the reductions that occur once you enter the uh, tax system. So what's the difference? Well, um, both of them establish this benefit, but the GAI targets poor households with this benefit reduction rate. There's no question it is a better targeted uh, instrument. And I say that, and I'm going to illustrate how that, A, makes it less costly and more palatable, and B, how that presents some problems in terms of, uh, of the design of programs as well. So it's not all cut and dried one way or the other. Um, so this, um, this tax rate is used to claw back benefits, and the basic income, on the other hand, doesn't claw back benefits. It goes to everyone. It's a pure income transfer and is taxed in the normal way. And so this lack of targeting, how does that matter? Well, what we did uh, in 2005, and I don't think the structure of the economy is changing uh, 
as rapidly as would uh, change these, uh, these kinds of numbers, but you can judge for that. We used the 2000 survey of labor and income dynamics, which was what was available at, to us at the time. We took a, a guarantee, which is common to the two programs, the basic income and the guaranteed annual income. We took it at 85% of a market basket measure. Uh, we like the market basket measure. I know Harvey is on record as liking the market bas basket measure, rather preferred to the statistics Canada local income cutoffs. But uh, I don't think the choice of, of measure and the level matters very much, and we show a bit of that in the paper. Then we uh, introduce the benefit reduction rate on the guaranteed annual income, which is uh, we take to be 50%. Now this has kind of been a standard that's been used. It's actually a pretty big rate. It's considerably more than the McDonald Commission proposed, which was only 20%. And it turns out that this number does matter, as I'll talk about. Um, the basic income costs are pretty big. They're around $185 billion. This does not take into account the tax back uh, amount, so some of that is recovered through the tax system. I take a figure of about 20% uh, that might be recovered from that. Uh, the GAI only costs $38 billion. Why? Because it only goes to people up to a certain level. The whole point of this benefit reduction rate is it reduces benefits and it reduces them fairly quickly, much faster. Uh, than through the tax system, whether in fact they're never eliminated entirely because the marginal tax rate is never 100%. So that's a pretty big number. It's about a factor of five between a basic income and a, and a guaranteed annual income. And it illustrates this point of targeting, which is essentially uh, makes the program less expensive and also, I think, more attractive uh, politically. Uh, the poverty gap is reduced about the same in the two cases. Uh, from about 7.7 .7 billion in 2000 to 2.6 billion under the uh, basic income and uh, about uh, 2.9 billion under the guaranteed annual income. So the targeting makes the transfers, as we say, more effective in reducing uh, poverty for a given dollar. Um, then we come to the labor supply response. Well, what's the labor supply response? Well, economists love to break this up into two things, but I think it's useful. Uh, in this and some, many other contexts, but this one in particular. One is what we call the income effect, which is the idea that if you transfer money to individuals and make them richer, they'll buy more of all things that they value. And we think that on average, one of those is not work, and so that uh, work effort will decline. Um, and I think this is a common uh, perception. Um, the size of it is open to uh, analysis, and I'll talk about that. Uh, then the other side of that, however, is if you uh, make work less attractive by uh, increasing the tax rate or reducing the returns to work. So, for example, if you introduce a tax rate or a benefit reduction rate of 50% that says for each dollar you recover, you're immediately only going to see 50 cents of it, what that does also is it shifts people away from the activity which is uh, less attractive the taxed activity towards other activities. In other words, it shifts it away from work. And so, whereas a guaranteed in annual income and a basic income both uh, have the income effect, and it's, it's pretty comparable, um, uh, at least initially, uh, the, uh, only the guaranteed annual income would have this substitution or disincentive effect associated with the tax rate um, because it's the only one that has a benefit reduction rate. And that's the difference where uh, the questions uh, of design uh, come in in terms of a guaranteed annual income. The size of these effects, well, they can be measured in a variety of ways. Most of the time, people have used non-experimental data. But in, in the late 60s and the 70s, we had the opportunity to construct uh, or conduct a series of experiments, one in Canada, four in the U.S., which looked at uh, this question and tried to grapple with it. Now, a lot of people would say the experiments are dated, but I think the real value of the experiments, at least to economists, was they were a way of calibrating what economists were doing in terms of the non-experimental data. And what I, I suggest is that over time that's been invaluable in weeding out a lot of uh, estimates that uh, have not been borne out by the experimental evidence. So this is the Manitoba basic annual income experiment in the uh, mid to late 70s. Um, it was a GI experiment. Um, I, Derek Hum knows far more of the details and the horror stories of it than, than I do, or he perhaps he will ever care to admit, but he's, he's not here. He's retired in Vancouver. 
Um, but basically, for our purposes, we, we uh, simply have to note that there were a variety of guarantee levels and tax rates used. They had to be better than the existing welfare system because there was also going to be a control group who, uh, uh, so anybody who was treated in the sense of given a guarantee and a tax rate had to uh, at least believe that they were better off than they would have been otherwise or they would not have participated. Um, and then there was the Dauphin so-called saturated site or saturation site, um, which had a single guarantee and tax rate applied to it. And the fact of that, uh, Evelyn Forger, I'm sure, has talked uh, eloquently this morning about how that was uh, used to analyze uh, outcomes later on compared to other Manitoba communities. And then there was a rural dispersed sample, uh, which was never analyzed. And uh, the U.S. one of the U.S. experiments focused on... Uh, on a rural site and didn't have much better uh, experience. Uh, so what is comparable to the U.S. Uh, negative income tax experiments is really this Winnipeg dispersed sample and uh, the Dauphin sample is unique in the sense it was the only saturated saturation site that was uh, was done in all the five experiments. Um, the major uh, focus of all of the five experiments in at least in terms of uh, the original analysis was the labor supply question, because that was the question that was in the forefront. Would it reduce labor supply of individuals and implicitly uh, reduce uh, output in the economy? Now, many economists would point out that people who choose to do something else other than weren't are necessarily being unproductive. They're doing non-market work. They're doing things that they value. But uh, the way we count things in the economy, that, uh, <coughs> that they don't count. Um, the Winnipeg dispersed sample uh, actually provided seven treatments. The very most generous treatment and the very least generous treatment of the nine were dropped out. Um, and they were given to randomly chosen low-income households, uh, and the labor supply outcomes were compared before and after treatment to a control group. So the simple idea, so-called difference in differences analysis, is that I look at the group that's receiving the treatments before and after they get the treatments, before and after the experiment, I monitor them through the experiment. I look at the control group before and after the experiment, and I take the differences, and I take the difference between the before and after of the treatment group and the before and after of the control group, so-called difference in differences analysis. That's the basic structure to get an overall effect. Economists were more ambitious than that. They also wanted to tease out these so-called income and substitution effects because they wanted to know not just how people responded in terms of labor supply, but how they responded, A, to being made better off in terms of more income in their hands, and B, uh, when they faced, say, a higher tax rate from the, uh, from the guaranteed annual income program how, and affected their uh, after-tax wage. So <coughs> the experiments did provide this uh, more reliable setting. The, the key focus was this random allocation, which solves a lot of problems that occur in non-experimental data. So in non-experimental data, you have all sorts of things happening, many of which will matter. Um, but if they uh, are not correlated with what you're concerned about, then uh, there's a lot of more, there's still noise in there, but the noise is not going to compromise the results in terms of biasing them. And uh, that is what the random allocation process uh, is intended to do. And the Manitoba Basic Annual Income Experiment had the advantage of having the, uh, the work done in the U.S. on random allocation to fall back on. So it was the final of, four, of five experiments. Uh, and I think in a somewhat biased interpretation, I suppose, did a much better job than many of the American experiments did, had less uh, experience at the time. Um, and our conclusion, looking at the experiments, uh, Derek Hum and I, was that the experimental results tended towards the low end of the estimates. If you look at a whole set of estimates uh, that were in, uh, available at the time from non-experimental uh, data, that is data that didn't come out of experiments, come out of real world uh, surveys, uh, and the four, five experiments, you found that the five experiments produced results that were relatively low in terms of labor supply response. We say few adverse effects have been found. Those adverse effects found, such as work response, are smaller than would have been expected without experimentation. It's a 25 word summary. Um, a little bit more on that, uh, and Extending that to today where you still see a variety of, of uh, an summary articles of what's happening in terms of labor supply estimates, where they tend to fall and, term and so on. Uh, what they tend to show is that the income effect is pretty small. 
I say here that a doubling of income support, so a 100% increase in the amount of income in a person's hands, might only reduce labor supply by 5 or 10%, according to the kind of consensus estimates you see uh, in the literature. And that's fairly small. And the income effect has always been, even in the non-experimental data, even in the earlier non-experimental data, relatively small. So I don't think this is, this is terribly controversial, but it's certainly good news for both the basic income and the, uh, and the, and the guaranteed annual income. Then uh, the substitution effect, this question of, the, of what happens when you change the tax rate that individuals are paying. These, these effects are bigger. Uh, I characterize them as about a factor of four bigger for men and about six bigger for women. So uh, if you have the uh, amount of money that a person receives by introducing a benefit reduction rate of 50%, then uh, you might uh, observe, say, a 10% reduction in labor supply for men and even larger, maybe even a 15% reduction for women. So it's those kinds of uh, magnitudes. So that suggests that care needs to be taken to um, design plans that improve, that keep these incentives to work alive. And this is something that we haven't been very good at doing in the past. I think uh, provincial governments have seen that in terms of the welfare wall and so on. I'll talk a little briefly about that. Um, what's happened to the idea of the GAI? Well, there are no full-blown examples of a guaranteed annual income or a basic income. Um, but the concept uh, of income-tested or targeted uh, benefit programs are now widespread refundable tax credits in particular. The provincial social assistance programs have, to some extent, reduced their tax back rates. For example, it's 70% in Manitoba now on, every, on each dollar earned after an initial exemption, which, at which it's zero up to, I think, $200. Um, and this reduces uh, the disincentives. These uh, tax back rates reduce the disincentives to work. So these movements from what usually used to be, say, 100% tax back rates down to about 70% have uh, provided some incentives to work that weren't there before and allow uh, some incentives for people to uh, leave the social assistance system. The <coughs> The final point I want to make, I guess, is this point that the GAI has been gaining acceptance uh, in terms of social policy, in terms of tax policy. Uh, the Guaranteed Income Supplement for Seniors is an explicitly uh, a guaranteed annual income program targeted at low-income seniors. Uh, the National Child Benefit, the Child Tax Credit, is a refundable tax credit that is fairly broadly targeted, but eventually uh, the benefits are eliminated entirely. The National Child Benefit Supplement is much more uh, greater targeted. In other words, it has a much higher benefit reduction rate. Uh, and it's very much targeted towards low-income families to combat child poverty. Uh, and the GST credit, again, is fairly heavily targeted through a heavy, a fairly large benefit reduction rate towards uh, low-income families to offset the costs, if you will, of the uh, GST. And indeed, we should think about uh, social assistance programs in terms not only of the guarantee, which is usually the focus, and it, uh, the social assistance programs certainly don't do very well on that score, um, but also in terms of the nature of the clawback and the incentives to work that are, exist in the, uh, in the system. And so uh, I, I think that's all I have to say. I know it's been a long day, and I hope uh, I didn't hurt you getting through it. Well, uh, speaking as an economist, it all depends on how it was paid for. If the, uh, if the uh, in guaranteed annual income or basic income was paid by reducing other programs or increases in taxes elsewhere or other so forms of revenue that didn't add to the deficit, I, I can't see that it would have any significant Um, I probably should have clarified that that would refer to uh, married women. And uh, the usual explanation is that the value of their non-market work is higher. Yeah, That's good, though. Yeah, single women, uh, 
uh, if they're differentiated, or in every married woman in particular, if they're differentiated from, uh, from other women, are, are typically have labor supply behavior that looks like men. No. <laughs> and you're assuming to four eight hour days or four seven and a half hour days? Because there's lots of people that have four day weeks. Uh, you know, the four and four kind of model operated by police, per, fire, paramedics, and so on. So pretty common nowadays. A lot of people work longer days to have a, a, a shorter week in that sense. Okay, well, thanks again, Wayne.